Hello, my name is Raffaella Mulas. I recently received my PhD from the Max Planck Institute for Mathematics in the Sciences. I am now a postdoctoral research fellow between the Alan Turing Institute of London and the University of Southampton. And starting from September, I will be back at the Max Planck Institute as a Minerva group leader. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, spectral theory of hypergraphs. So, first of all, what are hypergraphs and why do we study them? Hypergraphs are a generalization of graphs in which we still have vertices and now instead of just having pairwise connections between the vertices, we have edges of any cardinality. So we have connections of any size. For instance, in this picture, we have three times the same hypergraph on six vertices and two edges. And hypergraphs are useful in applications because they can model many empirical networks. For example, if we want to model a scientific collaboration network, we can model the researchers using the vertices and the papers using the edges. Or if we want to model chemical reaction networks, we can model the chemical elements with the vertices and the chemical reactions with the edges. And there are also generalization of classical hypergraphs. For example, in the oriented hypergraphs that were introduced by Nathan Reff and Lucas Rusnak, uh, we have uh, vertices, edges, and also the additional structure that for each uh, vertex uh, edge incidence we have a, a sign, either a plus sign or a minus sign, and these are the hypergraphs on which I will focus today. And in the chemical hypergraphs that I introduced together with my PhD supervisor Jürgen Jost, we also allow vertices to have both a plus and a minus sign for, a, for an edge. And the idea is to model catalysts in chemical reactions, since catalysts are part of a chemical reaction but are not changed by it. And recently, we also introduced the hypergraphs with real coefficients in which a vertex edge incidence is given a real coefficient. So this allows for the modeling of the probabilities that the vertices belong to the edges, for instance, or also this allows to model the stoichiometric coefficients in chemistry. And I also introduced recently the complex unit hypergraphs that are similar to the hypergraphs with the real coefficients, but instead of having real coefficients, we have coefficients from the complex unit circle. And as I said, I will focus on the oriented case. So formally, an oriented hypergraph is a triple where V is a finite set of vertices, E is a multi-set of edges, and edges are subsets uh, um, of the vertex set. Uh, it is a multi-set in the sense that different edges can contain the same vertices, but we label the edges so that we can treat them as a set. And we also have an incidence function that gives a plus one or a minus one if a given vertex belongs to a given edge. And if the sign is a plus, so if the incidence is a plus one, we say that V is an input for the edge E. If it is a minus one, we say that V is an output for the edge E. And as particular cases of oriented hypergraphs, we have that a signed graph can be seen as an oriented hypergraph such that each edge has cardinality 2, while a simple graph is a particular case of signed graph in which each edge has exactly one input and exactly one output. And why do we study spectral theory? Because the spectrum of any given operator associated to our hypergraph, which can be, for instance, the adjacency matrix 
or the Kirchhoff Laplacian or the normalized Laplacian on which I will focus uh, is known to encode important properties of the hypergraph and it can be computed with little computational effort. And let's now define the normalized Laplacian or better said the normalized Laplacians. First of all, for our hypergraph G that has n vertices and m edges, we define the incidence matrix as the n times m matrix whose rows correspond to the vertices, whose columns correspond to the edges, and that has entry iij equal to 1 if vi is an input for ej, and entry equal to minus one if vi is an output for ej and zero otherwise. Then we define the degree of a vertex as the number of edges in which that vertex is contained. And we let d be the diagonal degree matrix that has the degrees in the diagonal. And in order for D to be invertible, we simply assume that each vertex has a positive degree. And then uh, the normalized Laplacian can be defined as the n times n matrix obtained as the inverse of the degree matrix times the incidence matrix times the transpose of the incidence matrix. And similarly, one defines the dual normalized Laplacian as the M times M matrix defined as the transpose of the incidence matrix times the inverse of the degree matrix times the incidence matrix. Summarizing the basic properties of these two Laplacians, L as N real negative eigenvalues, where again N is the number of vertices, and these eigenvalues are always between 0 and n. Also, the dual Laplacian has um, real non-negative eigenvalues, and they are m counted with multiplicity, where m is the number of edges. And the non-zero eigenvalues of these two Laplacians coincide, which is the reason why we study both of them, because some properties are easier to study uh, from, the, from the point of view of L and other properties are easier to study from the point of view of the dual Laplacian. And we can use uh, the min-max principle in order to characterize uh, these eigenvalues using the relic quotients for functions on the vertex set and functions on the edge set. And in particular, as we see from uh, these formulations, uh, Thanks to the fact that we are using uh, these two Laplacians, we have two equivalent uh, characterizations of the eigenvalues. So this is very useful when proving something. And regarding the multiplicity of the eigenvalue zero, if uh, G is a simple graph, then the multiplicity of zero always equals the number of connected components uh, of G. And more generally, for general oriented hypergraphs, uh, this property is lost. In fact, uh, we can have uh, hypergraphs uh, that don't have zero as an eigenvalue, while this never happens for graphs. Uh, and we can also have uh, connected hypergraphs uh, with a very high multiplicity of zero. In general, we can characterize uh, the multiplicity of zero by saying that it is uh, equal to the number of vertices minus the maximum number of linearly independent edges, where in order to talk about linear dependence, we see each edge as the sum of all its inputs minus the sum of all its outputs. And as a generalization of bipartite graphs, we can define bipartite hypergraphs as follows. We say that G is bipartite if we can decompose the vertex set as a disjoint union, V1 and V2, such that for each edge, either E has all its inputs in V1 and all its outputs in V2, 
or vice versa, as here in this picture. And for the case of graphs, uh, it is well known that the largest eigenvalue has to do with bipartiteness, and the same holds also for the general case of hypergraphs. In fact, I proved these two inequalities involving the largest uh, Laplacian eigenvalue, and the lower bound here has to do with bipartite subgraphs or of G, while the upper bound tells us that the largest eigenvalue is always less or equal than the maximal edge cardinality with equality if and only if the hypergraph is bipartite and uniform, meaning that all edges have the same cardinality. So in particular, the upper bound of this theorem in the case of graphs tells us that lambda n is always less or equal than 2 with equality if and only if the graph is bipartite, and this is a very well-known result. Now, if G is a graph, its shear constant is an important geometric quantity defined in this way. It is the minimum over all non-trivial subsets S of the vertex set of the number of edges between S and its complement S bar over the minimum between the volume of S and the volume of S bar, where the volume of a set is the sum of the degrees of the vertices in that set. So H measures how difficult it is to divide the vertex set into two subsets, S and S bar, so that they have approximately the same volume and so that there are as few edges as possible between them. So in other words, we can say that H measures how different uh, the graph is from a disconnected graph. And the Chigar inequalities tell us that for a connected simple graph, we can bound the first non-zero eigenvalue of the normalized Laplacian both above and below using the Chigar constant. So we can also approximate the Chigar constant using the eigenvalue lambda 2, and we can say, therefore, that lambda 2 has this uh, geometric meaning of saying how far the graph is from a disconnected graph. And these inequalities can be reformulated as follows. If G is a simple graph, we let G plus be the signed graph that has um, the same vertex set and the same edge set as G and that has only inputs. So each vertex is an input for each edge in which it is contained. And then it's easy to see that G plus is a signed graph and also lambda is an eigenvalue for G if and only if 2 minus lambda is an eigenvalue for G plus. So this allows us to reformulate the Chigar inequalities in terms of G plus in this way, and in particular in terms of the second largest eigenvalue of G plus. And this formulation of uh, uh, the Chigar inequalities can be then, for some cases, be um, generalized to the case of hypergraphs. And in particular, for uniform hypergraphs, uh, I defined this generalized Chigar constant that has the same geometric meaning as the classical Chigar constant and that coincides with the classical one in the case of graphs. And I proved that if uh, G is a connected k-uniform and bipartite hypergraph, then the second largest eigenvalue can be bounded in this way, again, using the uh, Chigar constant. And these inequalities are a generalization of the classical Chigar inequalities for graphs. And the eigenvalues of the normalized Laplacian are also related to other constants of the hypergraphs, for instance, the coloring number.
The coloring number of a hypergraph, as for the case of graphs, uh, is the smallest number of colors that are needed in order to color the vertices so that if two vertices share a common edge, then they get uh, different colors. And we proved, for instance, this inequality involving the coloring number of a hypergraph and uh, the eigenvalues of the normalized Laplacian. And a related constant is the independence number. We say that a subset of the vertex set is independent if uh, it contains at most uh, one vertex that belongs uh, to an edge. And then the independence number of our hypergraph is the maximal cardinality of an independent set. And we also proved these uh, two theorems that relate the independence number of the hypergraph again with the eigenvalues of the Laplacian. Symmetries of hypergraphs are very important in applications and they are known to leave signatures in the hypergraph spectrum. For example, if we have an eigenvalue with a high multiplicity, then we know that this is probably reflecting a symmetry of the hypergraph. Um, for example, in this figure, I have what I called a hyperflower. This is a hypergraph with M edges, each containing T peripheral vertices and C central vertices. And again, the high multiplicity of these eigenvalues reflects the strong symmetry of this hypergraph. And finally, I wanted to talk about spectral measures and spectra classes, where the idea is that we don't longer focus on a single eigenvalue, but we look at the entire spectrum. So in particular, for each eigenvalue lambda e, we consider the Dirac measure centered at lambda e. We take the sum of all these measures and we normalize it by the number of eigenvalues. And then this is the spectral measure of G and it is a way of looking at the entire spectrum in a way that does not depend on the size of the hypergraph. And then for a sequence of hypergraphs, we say that this sequence belongs to the spectral class rho, where rho is a measure, if the sequence of spectral measures converges weakly to rho. And I showed that if we have two growing sequences of hypergraphs, G1n and G2n, where for each n, G1n and G2n are hypergraphs on n nodes that differ by uh, at most C1 edges of cardinality uh, at most C2. Then the difference between their spectral measures converges weakly to zero. So this is what we expect to happen because we are saying that if two sequences are not too different from each other, then the difference between the spectral measures uh, go to zero. And as I said, there are also generalizations of the oriented hypergraphs and many of the results that I just discussed uh, have also been generalized by me and my collaborators to the case of hypergraphs with real coefficients and complex unit hypergraphs. And I'm also studying applications of this theory, in particular to physics, um, to dynamics, and also to biology together with my group from the Alan Turing Institute and from Southampton. Thank you very much.